We heard yesterday that digital transformation was one of the IDB's key priorities under Vision 2025. That's why in this next session, we will hear from a series of speakers about how digital technologies can be leveraged to promote inclusive and sustainable development in the region, as well as our work in this area. Please join me in welcoming to our virtual stage, Moises Schwartz, Special Advisor, Vice President of Sectors, Susana Cordeiro, Manager, Institutions for Development Sector, Marcelo Cabrol, Manager, Social Sector, and Jose Maria Blasco Ruiz, Director of Infrastructure, Health, and ICT at ISEX, Government of Spain, who will be moderating this session. Adelante, Jose Maria. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending on where you are. On behalf of the Government of Spain, I would like to thank for the opportunity to be the moderator of this conversation today about such a key topic for the present and future of Latin American and the Caribbean countries and the IDB group, the Digital Transformation Agenda. The COVID-19 pandemic underscored the importance of digital technologies amidst emergency situations and limited physical interaction to ensure governments continue functioning, citizens continue having access to public services, and the private sector keeps operating. Digital technologies were key to the response of a highly demanded health system, the teleeducation of our kids, and the telework of an important percentage of the population. At the same time, the gaps limiting the region's ability to leverage digital technologies became also more evident. Half of the Latin American and Caribbean population does not have access to internet. Only 30% of government transactions are online. Half of school students were not able to access teleeducation during the quarantine, and thousands of small and medium enterprises disappeared because they were not ready to operate under the new normality. This is why it is so important for the region that the IDB group is presenting today to its public sector, private sector, and philanthropy partners, its digital transformation action framework to leverage digital technologies to promote inclusive and sustainable development in the region. We will hear today the IDB group's vision on how digital transformation can foster better and more equal opportunities for citizens, more productive, and innovative, more productive and innovative firms, a more effective, efficient, and transparent governments, thus advancing their Vision 2021 goals. The IDB Group has an important loan and technical cooperation portfolio, as well as a knowledge and capacity building program supporting Latin American and Caribbean countries' digital transformation endeavors. This operational and knowledge response has become more and more urgent to address the gaps and needs before mentioned. To, far, to further boost this response and leverage resources, knowledge and synergies, strengthening the joint efforts of the IDB group and its public sector, private sector and philanthropy partners is crucial. As a government of Spain officer, I'm happy to share today that Spain has always been committed to support this important agenda and the IDB group activities to foster Latin American and Caribbean countries' digital transformation. The approval earlier this year of two technical cooperation projects of 5.5 million US dollars that will provide broad support to this agenda is a reaffirmation of our commitment. So, I'm very honored today to be the moderator of this panel with IDB representatives that have played a key role in the preparation of the Latin American and Caribbean Caribbean's digital transformation action framework and will continue playing a key role in its implementation. Moises Schwartz, advisor to the Vice Presidency for Sectors and Knowledge. Moises joined the bank in 2017 and has served as regional economic advisor for the Caribbean Country Department and manager of the institutions for development sector. Before joining the IDB, Moises was director of the Independent Evaluation Office of the International Monetary Fund and also served as executive director at this organization. He also held several positions in Mexico's public administration, including president of the National Commission for Retirement, Retirement Savings, Finance Minister's Chief of Staff, 
Director General of International Financial Affairs within the Ministry of Finance, and Director of Macroeconomic Analysis and Economic Studies at the Bank of Mexico. Susana Cordeiro Herrera, Manager of the Inst Institutions for Development Sector. Before joining the IDB, Susana served as President of the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics. In, his, in, in this role, she led Brazil's Nas National Statistical Agency. During her tenure, she focused on reform on the Institute, preparation for the decennial census, engagement with multilateral institutions, and adaptation during the COVID-19 pandemic. She led the Institute in adapting to the disruption, disruption imposed by the disease, implementing a remote work platform, structuring multiple partnerships and financing arrangements, digitalizing data collection and launching new research service. Prior to this, she served as an economist at the World Bank, as well as in other roles at the bank earlier in her career. Marcelo Cabrol, manager of the social sector. Marcelo has been manager of the social sector since 2017. He leads an interdisciplinary team convinced that the best investment Latin American and Caribbean countries can make is in their human capital. He has co-authored a book on the potential and risks of artificial intelligence in the digital state. Prior to his appointment, Marcelo was manager of communication at the IDB. Previously, he served as chief of the IDB's education, uh, education division, where he emphasized the application of technology to expand coverage and improve the quality of schooling in the region. Throughout this time at the IDB, Marcelo was forged partnerships with companies, NGOs and universities in more than 20 countries to help advance in the IDB's development agenda. So let's start with the panel. And let's start with Moise Svats, advisor to the Vice Presidency for Sectors and Knowledge. Moise will present the IDB Group Latin American and Caribbean's Digital Transformation Action Framework and how it advances the goals of Vision 2025. Moises, the you. Thank you, thank you, Jose Maria. A pleasure to take part in this important event. And special thanks to all our partners that have supported us in this journey. We look forward to continuing advancing the digital agenda in the region, since there is still much more to do. I'll be presenting the digital transformation framework for Latin America and the Caribbean that the IDB Group has produced to promote an effective digital development in the region. Why do we need this? We need this because digital transformation improves lives. We always knew that digital transformation was relevant. However, the pandemic has made this even clearer. For citizens, it represents better access to opportunities and services. Firms innovate more and are more productive and governments are more effective and transparent. But digital transformation needs to be done properly since there are risks that need to be avoided and can derail the benefits of the digital transformation. To do it right, we need to avoid digital exclusion that would affect different segments of society. We need to make sure there is no infringement of the rights and privacy of citizens avoid a non-competitive environment and cybercrime. We have some experience now, and we know what works and what does not work. For example, we know that technologies to properly work need to be accompanied by a suitable institutional and regulatory framework. Digital talent, knowledge, and the private sector need also to be present. We also know that countries are different and are in different stages of digital development. And this is a fact that needs to be considered when developing digital agenda. This slide summarizes the way we at the IDB group see the development of the digital agenda. We start from the base of this figure and we move towards the top as the arrow indicates. We start with the enabling framework that supports the digital transformation of the different sectors. The enabling framework includes digital infrastructure, such as connectivity, digital talent, 
an, an appropriate regulatory framework and governance. These elements of the enabling framework are needed for the digital strategy to succeed. Every single sector of economic activity lies on top of the enabler. For example, the social sector, including education, health, and employment, requires the enabling framework to be in place. The same happens with digital fiscal management, digital government, digital justice, tourism, trade, digital financial inclusion, digitalization of MSMEs, smart cities, climate change mitigation and resilience, energy, transport, water, and sanitation, among others. Once sectors are supported by the enabling framework, the development objectives of inclusion, equality, productivity, employment, and efficient government are thus attained. Hence, citizens get better and more equal opportunities, firms are more productive, and public institutions offer better service. Here we have each of the elements of the enabling framework that would ensure the achievement of the referred benefits of the digital transformation. Just to name a few, for example, for governance and institutions, we mean a public agency responsible for digital transformation, national digital agendas, coordination mechanisms for the different actors, such as the public and private sectors. These elements would ensure that the digital transformation goals of growth and inclusion are attained. For the regulatory framework, we aim for proper regulations, data policy, digital identity, digital signature, and interoperability to protect rights, ensure confidence, and security. For digital talent, we need suitable skills and a digital innovation ecosystem to ensure economic agents leverage technologies and to prevent exclusion. And for digital infrastructure and tools, we require connectivity and cybersecurity, among others, as prerequisites of the referred transformation and to foster inclusive access. The role of the public and private sector is crucial to ensure the benefits of the digital transformation materialize. The public sector, for example, is key in making sure there is consistency and complementarity among sectors, that the enabling framework works, and the sectoral frameworks work in tandem and are consistent. And the private sector brings knowledge, experience, and resources. Some of the areas of our intervention are digital infrastructure, digital transformation of public management, digital transformation of social services, infrastructure services, sustainable development and digitalization, and digital transformation of the private sector. Some of these areas will be addressed in the next presentations. What are the goals we are pursuing with digital transformation? By developing digital infrastructure, we aim for universal and affordable internet access. The digital transformation of public management is expected to result in more efficient and inclusive access to services to citizens and firms and in fiscal sustainability. The digital transformation of social services aims for better access to these services. Same for the digital transformation of infrastructure services. Sustainable development and digitalization would result in the mitigation of greenhouse gases and an improved environment and public health. And the digital transformation of the private sector aims for innovation and competitiveness, better access to regional and global markets, among others. The pandemic has revealed the relevance of the digital transformation and the urgency to move forward. We need to seize the momentum of an accelerated digital transformation of the region. The digital transformation of the region is key to tackle many of the challenges we face. Every single sector of economic activity can benefit from the digital transformation and thus promote development and growth. In the immediate future, emphasis is being placed on the epidemiological management and digital health, on digital fiscal management and social protection, on the safeguarding of the productive fabric, on financial inclusion and digital education. To finalize, 
We know the region, we are present in the region, but we need to work together with our partners joining forces. IDV's Vision 2025 recognizes the relevance of the digital transformation as a critical opportunity. It is also key to support MSMEs, regional integration, gender and inclusion, and climate change opportunities. And we are here to make it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Moises. We will come back later with, uh, in the round of questions. But now we, we continue with uh, Susana cordeiro Herrera, Manager of the Institutions for Development Sector. Susana will present the digital agenda of the sector she leads, which aims to foster the digital transformation of governments and firms in the region. Please, Susana, the floor is yours. Susana, please, you are mute. Thank you. Good morning. Um, good morning, Jose Maria, uh, Moises, Marcelo. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'd like to start out just by saying that in my previous role um, to this uh, new job, I was on the client side serving in the government in Brazil and, and led a, di a digital reform in a 12,000 person organization across 600 agencies. And like many other public agencies um, in the world during the pandemic, it was critical to our productivity and um, to the functioning of our business models at, at that moment. And so um, it is a real pleasure to be here today because this transformation would not have been possible were it not for the support of partners. So to talk and speak today about digital transformation with all of the partners in the room, it's it's a real privilege and uh, an honor um, after the challenges that we faced uh, over the last few years on the countryside. Uh, so with that, I wanted to um, draw on uh, the framework that was just presented and um, and really um, show you how IFD uh, contributes and is present in, in this framework. Um, we are um, working on three of the six main areas of intervention. Uh, to give you an idea, over the last four years, we've um, been in, invested more than 14 billion in 111 loans. Uh, we've also had 283 technical cooperations and trained over 270,000 people across the region. Our interventions are in five key areas that I will um, soon turn to. Uh, but the idea and bottom line here is that we not only have impact on governments, but also in firms and citizens, um, directly or indirectly, through the better provision of public policies and services at the front line. So with that, I turn to the first, first area where IFD is engaged, um, connectivity. And here we're aiming for universal quality, affordable and secure internet access. And um, we don't wanna leave anyone behind. The idea is that this digital transformation, it's inclusive by nature. Um, and that's the focus uh, of all of these efforts is to democratize access um, to um, all of these services and opportunities. So we focus on critical infrastructure um, deployment, such as backbone network, spectrum transition to 4G and 5G, and especially access to more vulnerable populations and rural areas. We are also an important action actor in the region in terms of promoting improvements in policies and regulation. Um, it, uh, it is important uh, to emphasize the tall order of this challenge because around 200 million people are not connected to the internet and the investment needed to close this gap is estimated at 70 billion. 
So the potential impact of bridging this gap is tremendous. It would generate a GDP growth in the region of 7.7%, an increase in productivity of 6.3%, and a creation of nearly 50 million direct jobs. So what, to give you a flavor of our projects, um, we have projects at the national level in terms of connectivity, uh, like Paraguay, um, and, and we also have projects that focus on more rural areas, um, like the one uh, uh, rural connectivity in Guatemala. And, and these aim to close inequality and poverty gaps in the country. It aims to uh, um, reach the last mile and, 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 um, and be accessible to more vulnerable communities. Um, and it, primarily it has an aim uh, to go hand in hand with the development of digital skills and skills training. Um, and so with that, I wanted to turn to the second large area where we work, which is digital government. And, um, and the aim here is to strengthen the capacity, strength, strengthen the ability of government to deliver services um, to, for citizens, to citizens and firms. Uh, so we work on many dimensions as was described in the framework, but it goes through um, the formulation and strengthening of governance and institutions. It goes to work um, uh, in the regulatory framework and working with our counterparts um, to enable um, reform in different pieces of legislation, um, institutional reforms, and um, it moves to more cutting edge issues such as digital identity and cybersecurity and thinking about how to protect and secure um, this, uh, all of this effort um, to reform different aspects of the state. Um, and, it, uh, and, at, and then the bottom line of this digital government effort is to really simplify and become more efficient and reach citizens in an accessible way um, where we um, deliver services in a more user-friendly manner. And to give you just a, a sheer sense of numbers, online services can be 98% cheaper and 74% faster. The gaps in the region are as as large as uh, as well as uh, as large as the opportunities because if you look at it only five countries have digital identity less than 50 percent of the countries have interoperability of their platforms and less than 30 percent of the services are online so there is a huge way still for us to go and um and many opportunities um to move forward uh, in, in terms of our projects, we have one, uh, Uruguay is um, a classic example in the sense of being um, well-rounded in its approach um, to digitization um, and digital government more broadly. Um, AGESIC and, and the agency, central agents coordinating agency in Uruguay is really a, a model of excellence um, for the region in that sense. Having Uruguay, uh, ranking 26 um, percent in the world on, on on this dimension of um, digital government. Uh, I also um, now wanted to turn to our third big area uh, of where, where we're engaged, which is digital fiscal management. And the goal here is to work um, there, there's an impact um, to improve revenue collection. There is an impact on expenditure um, efficiency and um, and so in terms of fiscal management in the region, uh, dig digitization and digital government and the implementation of these reforms is really critical. Um, so to give you also a sense of how large this impact can be, uh, we estimate up to 30 billion in savings with electronic public procurement, for example, and up to a 50 billion increase in revenues with digitization of tax administration, including e-invoicing. We're also active in promoting smarter fiscal data systems, digital management of public investment, and taxation of the digital economy that can generate up to 10 billion of additional revenue for treasuries in the region. So if you look here in the slide, it gives you a sense of the magnitude and the potential of these um, investments in digital fiscal management. 
And I have two uh, examples. Uh, uh, Brazil implemented Profisco, a program that was organized um, nationally and then implemented some nationally across lots of different states um, so far in the country. And it's, it's had tremendous success um, uh, contributing to a 10% increase in tax revenues and a 3% increase in formal employment. So this is interesting because such a significant increase in formal employment um, shows that e-invoicing, for instance, can facilitate uh, the formalization of employment. In an economy like Brazil, where you have 40 million people that are in the informal sector, this has a, ta a tangible, significant effect for development um, in the country. Uh, so I now wanted to turn um, to our fourth large area of intervention, in, now in the private sector. And here we look at um, firms and investments in SMEs um, and talent, really investing in talent in STEM and STEM and thinking about what are what is the potential for growth in, in, in the region and, and how this digital transformation has to go hand in hand with skills training and skills development, but cutting edge skills training and development. And I will give you a sense of the numbers on that. Um, we have a talent gap in the region that's estimated at more than 1 million programmers by 2025. So in order to implement these reforms, we really need to foster and harness this challenge, which will be the backbone of the skills transformation that's necessary to implement these reforms. Uh, we also promote um, digital transformation of firms through technical assistance and financing in cooperation with innovation ecosystems. And we have important efforts to develop the digital talent, like I was saying, through boot camps, MOOCs, and other types of certifications. And with that, I, I wanted to turn to the last um, area of intervention, which is digital financial inclusion. And, and this is um, really important um, because we have partners with leading companies as well as um, client countries to increase the impact of these interventions. And emblematic projects of this, uh, of this area have been Chequeo Digital, and it's a tool to access um, digital maturity. Um, we also have sectoral in interventions within the construction, construction sector. And um, all in all, we have uh, trained nearly 300,000 people um, with programs such as the one um, in, in Costa Rica, for example. Um, so finally, um, a critical enabling um, factor um, uh, uh, for um, for development is, um, like I was saying, financial inclusion, and um, it has a potential um, to to um, uh, reach um, vulnerable um, populations in a, in a tremendous uh, manner. And um, but more than 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 the last mile we, we can now see that only 46 um, percent of adults in the region um, uh, that 46 percent do not have access to financial services and 22 percent of msmes do not have access to loans so here also the progress to be made, to be made is quite significant um, and we have promoted key lines of actions to address this issue, such as the fintech ecosystem in the region and private dialogues with um, fintech LAC. Um, and um, I, I, I wanted to uh, just end um, turning to, to an example uh, of, of the regulatory changes that happened in Mexico, where we, we collaborated with the government and were able to implement important um, pieces of legislation um, on infrastructure and regulatory framework processes um, that allowed uh, the progress, uh, tremendous progress in um, financial inclusion in the country. Um, with that, I, I, I uh, wanted to circle back to the initial point on the importance of working with partners and partners in, in three key um, segments, country donors, um, private sector partners and international development organizations. Um, you can see that we have a, a wide range of important um, stakeholders that have worked closely with us in different contexts and have thus really um, shouldered efforts 
and and we have put our best um, foot forward in in confronting this challenge um, in such a, a consequential time um, for government functioning and access to services um, from citizens and, and firms. Um, so with that, um, I invite partners to continue working with us, to continue engaging in our different um, lines of um, policy and, and, and reform efforts and, um, and continue on, on this um, path of digital transformation in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susana, for this uh, so complete and detailed presentation. Now, uh, we have Marcelo Cabrol, uh, manager of the social sector. Marcelo will present the social sector's agenda to foster telehealth, teleeducation, and telework in Latin American and Caribbean, and Caribbean countries. Please, Marcelo, the floor is yours. Now we, we are working. There you go. Thank you, Jose Maria. I started from the beginning. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night. Uh, and we know that we have a very heterogeneous uh, audience today. Uh, and thank you to Moises and Susana for setting the stage for my presentation. Um, let me let me start from, from the beginning uh, 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 with uh, our agenda. And, and I'm going to start from here. Uh, three years ago, in, in partnership with uh, the IDB Lab, we started Fairlack. And Fairlack is the largest regional alliance for ethical and responsible use of technology and artificial intelligence. We've been working with governments, with the private sector, with big companies, but also with entrepreneurs because IDB Lab is collaborating with the whole ecosystem, including VCs in, in this effort. We are also partnering with universities and NGOs. Uh, the question is, why did we start uh, uh, our Fairlack? And, and the, first the, the first answer is because at the point that we started this, and this is the reality today as well, the development of artificial intelligence was faster than the legislation of the countries to regulate it. So in order to help that solve that problem, we created the observatory to map all the initiatives that use artificial intelligence in the public sector. And the idea was to create a strong ecosystem where experiences and lessons were shared. And now we are launching the second edition of the observatory with UNESCO. So we try to use uh, ecosystem development to improve legislation and for legislation to catch up in this area. The second reason for, what, for, for, for Fairlack is that we think that artificial intelligence, and this is not very creative, but it's necessary to say, to be said, that artificial intelligence can be a fast and cost-effective way to attack some of the biggest social problem of the region. And I'm going to back, go back to that at this point. But let me give you a flavor of what we're doing today with this uh, type of technology. We have started with Fairlack doing pilots in the region. And we are working already, and in, in, in these are the examples that I have. For example, in Uruguay, we're using algorithms to identify which kids have the more chances to drop out from a school in Uruguay, and then working on them in order to retain them in school. Uruguay is one of the most advanced countries in Latin America, yet they have 60 to 50% dropout rate in secondary school. So you can see the, the, uh, the size of the problem. Uh, we're also using in the, in the area of health, uh, technology to detect di diabetic retinopathy in Mexico. Diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in Latin America and the Caribbean, and it can be prevented if artificial intelligence can help us to catch up with that kind of diagnosis. And we're also on the labor market side, we are putting together with artificial intelligence job seekers, training opportunities, and jobs in Costa Rica, for example. Those are three examples of the uh, artificial intelligence as a cost-effective way of working through these kind of problems. And last but not least, and, 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 and this is the third and central reason of her lack, we knew there would be a tremendous risk in privacy, equality, and ethics using this kind of technology. At that moment, when we started this, the conversation was mostly in the USA and Europe, but it was a question of time until it arrived to the region, and it's already here in the region. So we have created a diverse group of experts on artificial intelligence topics, data ethics, human rights, and the digital economy that help to strengthen the agenda of leveraging responsible artificial intelligence to solve the biggest social challenges in Latin America and the Caribbean. These experts, along with four uh, hubs 
one in Colombia, Uruguay, Mexico, and Costa Rica that are working with the whole region are constantly discussing public policy ethics uh, frameworks and artificial intelligence policies in general in the region. Now, we were able to see a little bit into the future of artificial intelligence in Latin America and the Caribbean, but of course, what we were not able to see was that a global pandemic was coming and it deeps consequences. So we have seen a chain reaction on innovation, adaptation, and rapid behavior change during the pandemic. It has accelerated not only artificial intelligence, but the whole digitalization process in the region. Let me give you a very impressive number in our field, just in Colombia to start with. The number of telemedicine contracts increased from 1.4 million before the pandemic to 101 million during the first year of the pandemic. We foresee in these numbers a profound digital transformation of basic social services and huge opportunities in telemedicine, teleeducation, and telework in the near term. Let's start with health again. The, the situation before the pandemic was already difficult. In, in fact, the devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in life can be largely attributed to underfunded before the crisis. A, a good number to illustrate the situation was the number of beds and doctors per capita. Let me show you this number. Lack had an average of 2.1 hospital beds and two doctors per thousand inhabitants. That half the level of OECD countries. With the pandemic, governments had to rapidly take steps to decongest, decongest I'm sorry, healthcare facilities, improve the quality of, of care and lower costs. Telemedicine emerged at that point as an effective and affordable means to relieve hospital overload and encourage the use of remote consultation. But the question is how to make these changes permanent and how to make these changes with quality. And here, of course, we see the usual suspects. And Moises and Susana already alluded to them, so I'm going to just quickly enumerate them. First of all, we have an issue when talking about telemedicine of low levels of electronic identification. We also have a question of lack of interoperability and, of course, the issue of connectivity. So quality and access need to be worked around these three uh, important issues. Legislation also remains highly uneven across countries, and this is an important point. A recent IDB study found that only 10 out of 26 Latin countries have effective regulatory frameworks around electronic health records. In addition, healthcare providers' overall digital readiness is another basic constraint to the growth of telemedicine. They need, of course, IT infra infrastructure, strategic planning, and we need specialized human capital working with them. Together with PAHO, we develop a tool to measure providers' readiness to offer telemedicine services. Many countries are already working on that uh, toolbox in order to make telemedicine possible. Let me, let me change a little bit to another interesting use of technology in uh, health. And it's a change from a remedial to a preventive use of medicine. Some countries are already implementing digital strategies to promote health-related habit changes. A very exciting initiative that we're working in on is Jamaica Moves, an app led by the Ministry of Health and Wellness of Jamaica and key partners to improve nutrition and physical activity among Jamaicans. We already see behavioral changes working with digital transformation. Uh, let me move very quickly from health to education. And uh, of course, I'm gonna start with the same setup uh, during the pandemic, schools in Latin America suffer particular severe, severe setbacks. Uh, schools in the regions were shut down for an average of 158 days compared to 95 day global average. We have one of the regions with the most, with the highest rate, rate, rates of closure in the world. In response to the crisis, 96% uh, of Latin American education ministries use radio and or television to offer some form of remote learning. 94% implemented an online education portal. But there's still evidence, and there's still little evidence about how did it work. We, we don't know how they work, but we're working on that. Until now, we only have estimates and projections. But for the first time, we, we start to have real data. And let me give you a piece of real data that we just uh, collected. We found that in large countries such as Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, and Peru, between 43 and 50% of students in primary or secondary schools did not participate in learning activities whatsoever or had zero interaction with teachers during the closures. 43 to 50% with no learning. This means if we, if we extrapolate that more than 100 million students essentially dropped out in 2020. 
Furthermore, remote learning is not the same that hybrid learning. We need to bring students back and rely on quality hybrid learning. If we want that to happen and to work, there are two crucial areas to concentrate and we're working on them. The first one is education management information system that enable continuous monitoring of each student's learning trajectory. If we don't know how much they're learning and where they are, it's very difficult to solve the problem. And the second part is teacher, teachers with digital skills. Only half of the teachers in the region are able, according to their own uh, uh, opinions, to perform basic tasks using computer applications. But there's a, also a great risk to increase even more inequality if it's not correctly done. We need to pay special attention to those that have no connectivity, as Susanna and Moisette said, those that have no access to hardware, and also something that sometimes is not said, we have to work with parents for them to acquire digital skills so they can help uh, their kids to do their work. Let me finish the education part with uh, a special focus, which is the great risk with girls. In a region that girls have been able to perform better than boys in schools during the pandemic, the burden of household work for primarily again on girls. We need to find solutions to this problem. Among other solutions, hybrid education strategies must, of course, anticipate and compensate for such disparities. We're working on, on those opportunities. The market also believes there's an opportunity of in tele, tele education. It's not only the public sector, it's also the private sector that can contribute to this conversation. In Brazil, for example, the education technology platform Descomplica offered test preparation and courses. In 2021, it secured 83 million private investment, uh, the largest round ever received by an education technology startup in Latin America and the Caribbean. So we have public and private sector responses and opportunities there. Lastly, let me tell you about telework. And, and, and prior to the pandemic, telework was uncommon. Only 3% of, of employed teleworkers telework in Latin America and the Caribbean in 2019. Then, of course, everything changed. Downloads for teleworks applications, and this is mimicking what's happening in the world, uh, increased 20-fold between January and March of 2020. Data from Argentina, Chile, Costa Rica, Peru, and Uruguay shows that between 20 to 30% of salary employee employees work remotely during the year. There was a huge jump from pre-pandemic levels. In a survey, 90% of responses respondents reported a better quality of life due to expending more time with their families, flexible scheduling, and increasing productivity. We see a huge opportunity there as well. And this opportunity is especially true for women. Women, we know, had excited, ex exceeded the labor market at twice the rate of men. We are observing a very rapid widening of gender inequality in labor participation. Telework and technology could help, should help, uh, women to come back to the market and do it with better conditions and salary. But in order to make this possible, we need to work at least in three areas. The first one, it's one, one again, once again, connectivity. The internet was inaccessible to most workers during the pandemic. In Bolivia, when surveyed about obstacles to telework, 58% of responders reported lack of access to internet. Without uh, connectivity, we have no telework. A large share of adults in the region has also little computer experience. Digital skills are important here once again. Only 43% of servers responding in Peru reported having such skills. And of course, gender issues. And I put special emphasis on this point. Telework brings flexible scheduling and higher productivity. But evidence shows also that it could also interfere with personal lives, additional household chores, childcare, and homeschooling. Regulation can help and should help. Even in the end of 2020, Mexico, Panama, El Salvador, Chile, and Argentina, they had passed laws regulating telework, and that was a good news. But there were laws created for the special situation of the pandemic. So still remains to be seen whether they will provide adequate protection for labor rights, long-term problem, and whether they lead to permanent changes in work patterns. But let's be more positive and talk about exciting signals that we see on the region, especially for traditionally excluded groups. The first one is the Brazilian branch of the Dutch platform Specialistern, for example, has given, which has given transgender workers access to remote work opportunities while avoiding discrimination. Specialistern also offers 
by the way, high quality job opportunities in areas such as software testing, quality control, and data conversion, conversion to people with autism, autism, autism spectrum disorders. And this model is currently being replicated and scale up by IDB Lab in Mexico. Now, let me finish here. Many of the elements necessary to achieve this transformation are already in place. High urbanization levels in the region facilitates this process and make digital technologies more widely available. We're still a long ways, as Susana said, but we have to work together to get there. We really believe that if governments combine incentive for expanded private investment and competition in broadband with regulatory reforms in health, education, and labor, the region could see historic advances in the next five years. We're going to have better health, better education, better work, and all with an ethical and more equal lot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcelo. Uh, thanks uh, to all the panelists for the presentations. Now we will have a round of questions for each of them. I have one question for each of the panelists. I would love to be longer with you, but we are very short of time. So I will beg the panelists to answer just one minute to this final round of questions that as a way of conclusion, okay? So the first question is for Moises. And uh, the question is, what is the vision underlying the digital transformation enabling framework? And what are its operational implications? Please, Moises. framework that I alluded to serves as a methodological guide on how to advance the digital transformation in Latin America and the Caribbean. If we were to start from scratch, one would follow the enabling framework. That is, we would start with making sure connectivity is there and the legal and regulatory framework are also in place. One would also make sure that digital talent is present and so on with the other elements of the enabling framework that would support the proper development of the digital agenda. However, we understand that reality is always more complex than a textbook case. For example, countries have different levels of development, and within a country, one would also find that in their digital development, some sectors are more advanced than others. Hence, our interventions need to take the enabling framework into consideration and make sure that further developments support one another and work in tandem, complementing each other and not, not obstructing each other. For example, uh, the adoption of a technology in one sector should be compatible or at least should not interfere with the digital technologies in other sectors. In addition, we need to understand that each country is different. Their digital development might also be different and the enabling framework basically provides a guide on how to do this and how to move forward. Thank you very much, Moises. Uh, Susana, uh, I beg you a one minute answer to this question that uh, in your presentation, there was an interesting and constant reference to fostering inclusive digital transformation. What do you mean on that? Thank you, Jose Maria. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, Jose Maria, for this great um, and important question. Um, so it, it, I think um, the answer to your question is in the analog area era, people were left behind for many different reasons. But in the digital area, it, it brings down costs. Inclusive by design. And um, and this and, and and to that end, I think there are two critical areas um, that we have to move forward um, together with counterparts and all our partners um, to really think through uh, how to implement um, reform. One is the regulatory and policy framework, and and thinking about that in a way where um, what we're doing does not create um, draws on economies of scale and we're not have a, a duplication of efforts. Um, so setting up um, the framework in a way that enhances 
the ongoing efforts that are happening in the country. And I think a second um, important uh, element of, of inclusion is the human capital dimension and skills training. I, I, I think this digital transformation cannot be spoken of without um, thinking through how this training will occur in, in all across all the supply chain of, of human capital and, and thinking about what these bottlenecks are, how we how we can address them. And, and these will require different tailored solutions um, at, at different points of this um, pipeline. And, and so with that, um, I wanted to thank you once again um, for this opportunity and, and, and for this um, important question. Thanks to you, Susana. And finally, last but not least, question for Marcelo. Uh, what are, in your view, the key questions our partners joining us today should be thinking about regarding technology development in the region's social sector? Thank you, Jose Maria, for the question. And, and let me let me be very quick. There are three topics, uh, thinking about the three sectors that we're working on that are important. Uh, uh, the, the first one, and I would I would put emphasis on this, it's to ensure that we don't have digital silos in health. Uh, there's, there's, of course, a risk of, uh, if we don't work properly, that telehealth system, telemedicine, uh, do not communicate with other health systems, both on the private and the public sector. So it's very important for us to work uh, to, to create uh, no silos in digital adoption in the in the in the in the in the health area. This is important because many of the, our partners already have the uh, experience working on those kind of policies. Uh, the second one in education, I would I would uh, focus on inequality issues, and and here a very specific challenge. And the challenge is how can we guarantee in the next five years access not only to connectivity, to but also to digital distance learning platforms of quality to 100% of students in Latin America and the Caribbean. Connectivity, but also platforms can be key for equality in education. And last but not least, when we think about uh, telework, uh, the, the focus has to be on women and flexibility. Uh, we, we see an opportunity here to equalize access, to look for more flexible work alternatives. But as I said, the challenge is flexible work alternative for quality jobs and with a uh, focus on inclusion. Those are the three questions I think that are the most important one looking at technology and how we can actually leverage them for this uh, for the social sectors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcelo. I, I agree with all of you. It has been a pleasure for me. Uh, thank you, ITV, for the invitation. And I would also like to thank all the panelists for their presentations about these very important and relevant topics and all the audience joining us today. Please, we invite you to continue joining us for the next session on gender and inclusion. Thank you so much. Thank you to the speakers and especially Jose Maria. The government of Spain has been a key partner in promoting the digitalization agenda of the IDB group in the region.